It seemed like a normal day as businessman Mark Moore headed toward the ball field, but he was experiencing some unusual physical symptoms. Little did he know a long medical battle was ahead, but how would his faith in God help him weather this storm? Welcome to Weekend Connection. My name is Mike Dyes. Now, let's get connected. At 46 years old, Mark Moore was the co-founder of a multi-million dollar company when he was hit with two strokes that nearly took his life. He spent a month in a coma and slowly had to relearn how to do some of the most basic things of life. Stay with us as we learn about the warning signs and treatment of strokes, and as we find out about the vital role of faith in Mark's recovery and his new outlook on life. Mark Moore, uh, the uh, author of A Stroke of Faith, A Stroke Survivor's Story of a Second Chance at Living a Life of Significance. Uh, Mark, uh, welcome to Weekend Connection. Thank you for having me. Well, let's go back to that time right before you suffered the strokes. As I mentioned, you were the founder of a, of a multi-million dollar company. What would people have seen from the outside of your life? From the outside, people would probably say, oh, that guy got it all going, right? You know, I, I was, um, as you said, 46 at the time, um, in excellent health. You know, I, I, I wasn't, I didn't have high blood pressure. I didn't have high cholesterol. I didn't smoke. I didn't drink. I wasn't diabetic. I wasn't obese. And I exercised. I had started five different companies, and at that point had been successful in selling two. Had raised over two billion dollars, and it was, I would say, by most people's account, pretty successful in the business world. Mm -hmm. Take us back to that day when you had your stroke. What was happening, and uh, how did it all come about? May twelfth, two thousand seven, and it was a normal Saturday. It was the Saturday before Mother's Day. And I woke up and I was taking my son, I was helping coach his baseball team and he was having practice that day. And as I took him to baseball practice that day, I felt fine and driving there. But once we got to the field, when I got out of the car, I realized something was wrong and I was losing my balance. I was having difficulty standing up. But I'll be honest with you, uh, I didn't think there was anything seriously wrong, Mike. Mm -hmm. I just thought it was an unusually hot day and I, I hadn't eaten lunch, and I'm like, you know, I had a very light breakfast. And I'm like, oh, you know, maybe some of this had to do with all of that, right? Mm -hmm. So, mm -hmm. the, the, and to my point, to show you that I wasn't particularly concerned, um, as I was walking to the field, although I was having trouble with my balance, I was more concerned with the fact that I was helping to coach a bunch of 15-year-olds, and their parents were dropping off for baseball practice, and I did not want the parents seeing me stumbling around and thinking, ah, oh, my son's... My son's coach is drunk at 2 o'clock mm -hmm. in the afternoon. Mm -hmm. So I was more worried about that than, than anything else, to be honest with you, Mike. So as I walked to the field, what I did was, uh, because I was losing my balance, I got down on one knee and untied my, base, my baseball cleats and retied them, switched legs, did, did the same thing with the other foot, to, then got back up trying to just get myself together. And I'm like, okay, my balance is a little bit better. Let me get, get to this field and got to the baseball field and ended up, helping coach baseball practice for two hours. Mm -hmm. So you mentioned a loss of balance. Were there other warning signs that uh, you just missed, or was that pretty much all that was going on? That was in May of 2007. In January, excellent question, Mike. In January 2007, I started experiencing some extreme migraine headaches mm -hmm. in January 2007. It, it, it would occur about once a week, and it would last a minute or two. The first time it happened, and I had never had migraine headaches in my life. The first time it happened, you know, I was, I was a little concerned, but not overly. But what happened, but I came home and did tell my wife, who's a registered nurse, I'm like, hey, I got this really bad migraine headache at work today. And she goes, well, you know, you know, if it happens again, then maybe you should go see the doctor. Well, the next week, Mike, it happened again, week number two. Exact same thing. I'm at work. I get this extreme migraine headaches so bad that what they have this what they call an aura where it, it affects your vision hmm. it's as if someone would take a window screen and put it in front of your face and went back and forth very very fast you know if i look at you it's just it's a blurred distorted vision mm -hmm. so what happened the second time and clearly i was i was concerned then came home i said told my wife it happened a second time 
I'm going to call my doctor and go see him. And I went to see my doctor, and, and I went to see my general practitioner, and he's like, Mark, you were just in here not too long ago. We ran a physical. We'll run another physical, make sure everything's okay. He's like, Mark, everything's okay. Good. Your blood pressure's okay. Cholesterol's okay. Everything's okay. He goes, but here's what I would recommend. I'm going to send you to see a specialist. I want you to go see a neurologist, and let's see if he can determine why you're getting these headaches. So I went to see a neurologist, and I, the neurologist ran a litany of tests. He ran MRIs, MRAs, could not determine what was causing these mig- migraine headaches. And my, they continued, the same, about the same frequency, about once a week uh, for about a minute or two at a time. Now, we ran these tests for five months. By the time we got to May, still no determination. I went to get a second opinion, so I went to a second neurologist. He ran tests. He also could not determine what was going on. And then that was on a Tuesday, and then that Saturday was when I then had this had the first stroke on Saturday and the second stroke uh, the Monday after Mother's Day. Mm. And, you know, at the practice, to your point, I wasn't aware of, of anything about a stroke, right? So I knew nothing about strokes, mm-hmm. but I've, I've become pretty learned now. And the American Heart Association has an acronym, Mike, that they use called FAST, F-A-S-T. The F stands for facial drooping. The A stands for arm weakness, mm-hmm. the S stands for speech difficulty, and the T stands for time to call 911. And I mention that because I did not know this at the time. And when I was going to coach the baseball practice, had I known that acronym, I might have realized that, you know what, I'm having arm weakness. This could be a stroke, and I could get to the hospital. And I would like our listeners to understand that FAST acronym, and that can apply to them or any of their loved ones. Um, so... F-A-S-T, facial drooping, arm weakness, speech difficulty, time to call 911. And the reason that we say time to call 911, Mike, is because what we found is that the faster we get to the hospital, the better our chance of recovery, and that every minute someone has a stroke, we, we estimate they lose about a million brain cells every minute. Mm. So, but, but I get back to when I got to that field, and I was able to go through baseball practice, Mike, which to, I remember afterwards, I remember talking to my doctor. I'm like, well, how was I able to do that if I was having a stroke? He's like, well, the stroke was just beginning, and your adrenaline was pushing you through the baseball practice. Because, Mike, I was running the base pass. I'm doing pitching practice. I'm doing batting practice. I'm outfield practice. I'm doing everything. But, Mike, the minute I stepped off that field, I felt the symptoms, and they were, they were still there, and they were worse now. I mean, I mean, they were really bad. I mean, I'm at the point now, Mike, I can barely get to my I'm, – I'm, I'm walking very slowly to get to my car. Mm-hmm. I get to my car, and I tell my son it's the Monday before Mother's Day. And up to that point, Mike, I had always brought Mother's Day cards for my son. He was 15 and gave them to him and said, hey, sign this card and give it to your mother. But now he's 15, and I'm like, on our way home, I'm going to stop at this Hallmark store, and I'm going to let you – pick out the car for your mother for Mother's Day. Mm-hmm. Um, but we stopped at the Hallmark store. We go in, and I, but now as we're walking, I, tell, I go, son, I'm not feeling too well. We're going to go in. We're going to let you pick out this car. And depending on how I feel when you get out here, I'm going to have to call your mother to come get you. Because it was progressing very, very quickly. We got to the Hallmark store. He got the car. We were out probably within two minutes. And Mike, by the time I got the car, by the time I got out the store, I mean, the symptoms had progressed to the point where I could barely control my left arm. I certainly couldn't walk, and there was nowhere I could drive. So I, I took my phone, uh, had my son dial, dial um, my wife and his mother, and told her to come get my son. Um, and she goes, do you need me to take you to the hospital? I go, no, I need you to call the, call the ambulance and have them come get me, because I knew at that point I knew it was pretty bad. Mm. So you were basically, you're unable to walk, and your arm, you could barely move that. Uh, so basically, you would have looked like uh, you were limp there and uh, sitting on the side or on the curb, something like that? That's correct, Mike. By the time my wife got there, well, first of all, the ambulance got there first. And by the time they got there, Mike, I was laying on the ground at this point. Mm. I, was, I sat on the wall of a flower bed, but because the symptoms were progressing so quickly, I could no longer support myself. People walking by, and they're like, are you okay? And I'm like, I got ambulance is on his way. I think I'm okay. And But, Mike, you make a very good point. It was at that point, that was the first moment I then said to myself, you know what? 
I hope I'm not having a stroke. I hadn't even thought about it. Mm. And then when the medics, uh, when they came, they picked me up, took me in the ambulance, and they were like, hey, you know, they didn't know what was happening. Took me to the hospital, and the initial diagnosis was you had a mini stroke, uh, but we think you'll be okay. We're talking with Mark Moore, author of A Stroke of Faith, a stroke survivor's story of a second chance at living a life of significance. I think it would be good, uh, maybe we should have done this earlier, how would you define what a stroke actually is? That's a good question, Mike. A stroke is an attack on the brain, and more times than not, uh, what happens, a blood clot will cause a stroke, but it's an attack on the brain. Um, and, and that's probably the simplest way to describe it. Um, and what happens is, because a lot of people hear about the physical ailments, um, and when you can't walk or you, or you lose ability to use your, your left hand or your left side, a lot of that is because the brain cells have been injured or scarred. And so there's really nothing physically wrong with, with your leg or your arm. It's just the brain cells that tells you to use that left arm and that left leg. Mm -hmm. That's what's been scarred. Okay. Now, to move ahead on the story, you ended up uh, in a coma. Tell us how that came about. You know, when I when I went to the hospital, I tell you, I had that first stroke on that Saturday, but because they it was a misdiagnosis, they didn't realize that I had a full-blown stroke. I was still in the hospital, though, and on Monday, I had a second stroke. Well, that second stroke led to some complications, and I had to perform life-saving brain surgery because an artery in the brain had, had dissected and releasing blood into the cavity where the brain sits, putting pressure on my brain. Um, which could have killed me, or at the very least, bring about severe brain damage. And so they performed life-saving brain surgery and ended up being in a medically-induced coma for four weeks. Well, we are uh, quickly running out of time. We're going to have to uh, move along here in the story so that we get to, the, uh, to some of the faith journey as well. Let me uh, ask you, though, um, when you awoke from the coma, what was that like? Uh, what was the process? What do you remember first when you came up after about a month being in a coma? Well, well the first thing I remember is, I think I mentioned when I woke up, was I saw this early morning newscast on where the gentleman said, and this week it will be Father's Day. And I just remember thinking to myself, did he just say Father's Day? And my, mm -hmm. I, I left, my recollection was Mother's Day. And then when I looked around the room, I realized I had tubes all over the place, Mike. I had tubes in, coming out of my, my, my throat, my stomach, both arms, and my, my groin. And they, they were coming everywhere. And I'm like, wow. And to be honest with you, I was scared. Um, I sat in that bed, and I, and I was just scared because I didn't know what was going on. And it wasn't until my wife came in about 9 o'clock, and then she told me that, in fact, I had suffered two strokes, um, not a mini stroke. I had a full bone stroke and then a second stroke, and then I had to, they had to perform um, life-saving brain surgery. And then I had a long recovery ahead of me. Mm. Uh, someone thinks of stroke, and uh, that could be a fearful thought. Oh, that could happen to me. How did you get through the fear and the situation you were going through? How did your faith help, and how did it change during this time? You know, that, that, that's an excellent question again, Mike. And how I got through it was really simply by surrendering. And that's what I tell people and giving up control. And for Mike, for me, that was a difficult one because as an entrepreneur and a businessman, you know, my life was really, I spent a lot of time being in control. And this was one instance when I realized, I, you know, I couldn't be in control. I had to surrender and I had to give up control and place my faith and trust in a high being and that being God and saying, you know, look, look, I'm going to trust him to lead me out of this out of this predicament. Mm -hmm. You went from acceptance to surrender and from hope to faith, didn't you? Correct. The medical profession, they talk about when you go through these um, kind of, you know, life-altering illnesses, that you go through a range of emotions. You know, you go through anger and denial and fear. And I tell people, I went through all of those. But the medical profession said on the back end, to get a full recovery, they want you to get to the point where you have acceptance and hope. And what I tell people, for me, acceptance was really was surrendering to God, relinquishing control. And where they talk about uh, really hope, that was really faith, placing my faith and trust in God and allowing Him to lead me. 
Mm-hmm. And, you know, that, you know, you know like that, that, that's a big deal. Giving up control is a big deal. Surrendering is a big deal. But I tell people that was the best thing I did because the, the outlook on my recovery absolutely changed. Prior to that, I was not sure I, was, I could handle the recovery, I'll be honest with you. I was many times, I just wanted to quit. I'm like, I don't want to do this. This is, this is too hard. I don't want to do it because the mountain seemed too big. But the minute I was able to surrender and release control, that mountain no longer seemed like a mountain, right? It just seemed like an anthill. I did all the things that therapists asked me to do, and my recovery simply took off. Hmm. We've been talking with Mark Moore, author of A Stroke of Faith, a stroke survivor's story of a second chance at living a life of significance. And in his story is how scripture, prayer, and Christian music played a role in his recovery. Uh, But uh, ultimately, Mark, what is it that you hope people get as they hear your story? I hope what they realize is is that, first of all, even if you have um, one stroke, or in my case, two strokes and major brain surgery, you can have a full recovery and lead a life of significance. And so I want people to realize that. And the second thing, that if we're willing to surrender and place our faith and trust in God, you know, if it's his will, you know, anything is possible. Because um, I'll be honest with you, if you would have told me 10 years ago I would be sitting here today doing this, I would have told you absolutely not. I did not believe it. But yet with God, you know, anything is possible. Hmm. A com. if you'd like to find out more. A stroke of faith.com. Mark Moore, thank you for sharing with us today here at Weekend Connection. Thank you very much for your time. I appreciate it. My name is Mike Dyes. Join us again next week for Weekend Connection. Thank you for listening to this feature, a production of BBN, the Bible Broadcasting Network. BBN provides 24 hour Christian programming, great Christian music, and Bible teaching. Listen to BBN by clicking the link in the description.